How we doing? Everybody good? Oh, sorry. Do we have a little feedback going on? Good? We good? Wow, that was amazing. What a, what a great job. Um, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, whoops. What am I doing? Am I doing something weird or is there an alarm? Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, welcome to the final day of the, uh, the National Aquatic, or the, uh, Aquatic Workshop. I What? Yeah, nailed it. Nailed it. So it's right up there. Aquatic Marine and freshwater eDNA. Uh, I apologize. You guys all did a tremendous job getting up pretty early this morning to get down here. Uh, fantastic and a big kudos. Thank you so so much. Um, uh, the, uh, the the order of the events today. I've got to start with a big thanks to. Oops, sorry. I've got to click the right clicker. Sorry. Got two machines going on here. Where do I point it? Okay, there we go. Big big shout out and thank you to all our workshop partners and sponsors. Uh, especially a big shout out to the Johns Hopkins crew for hosting us uh, over the last two years. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> two years, two days, two, two days, two days, not years. And everybody else, it, it's been a, a fantastic uh, set of days. Um, and also a big uh, th thanks to the steering committee and, and everybody who put all the hard hours and work into it. I think over the last two days you saw uh, the results of all that hard work and we have a ton of information and feedback uh, about the how, of how we move forward in this, in this um, uh, endeavor. Uh, it's super exciting and the time is right. And I'm just gonna uh, say, you know, there's three things. You know, I think we demonstrated that we're organized. You know, we're unified now under the national strategy. We're ready for business and open for investment, you guys. So I think we're, we're in a good spot right now. It's really exciting. So with that, I'm going to welcome Ellen Stofan, who's the Undersecretary for Science and Research, up to the podium to give some welcoming remarks. Members of the scientific community, colleagues and friends, welcome to the Smithsonian's Museum of, uh, National Museum of Natural History. This is an exceptional venue to celebrate the culmination of the third national workshop on marine eDNA. Many people think of the Smithsonian as a bunch of museums, but since its founding in 1846, it's always been a science-based organization. More than 500 scientists do groundbreaking research to understand the myriad life forms on planet Earth and unravel the complex intertwined relationships between ecosystems and people. And it is here in this museum that the Smithsonian stewards in perpetuity the national collection of over 45 million specimens across all marine groups. The Smithsonian has the largest library of marine life, a Rosetta Stone that allows the link between sequ sequence reads and natural history knowledge, allows for the democratization of biodiversity studies and gives decision makers the practical, actionable information for evaluating policy and prioritizing resources. The Smithsonian does not undertake the responsibility alone. Collaboration is key, just as you have witnessed during this week's conference, and that many of you will witness in the coming days at the Capitol Hill Ocean Week. It is all of you, the international, federal, state, and local partners, the public and private entities that will use our collections to build out and improve voucher-based genetic reference libraries. In this capacity, natural history museums function as global biodiversity accountants, translating and tracking the currency of, of change. The National Museum of Natural History is also committed to archiving environmental samples as a new sample type. These collections are time capsules of whole communities and allow for reuse and future science that we can't even imagine today. We're working with a variety of partners, including NASA, BOEM, and USGS, to curate these valuable samples. Collaboration is also the principle behind our new initiative, Life on a Sustainable Planet, that I'm privileged to lead on behalf of the entire Smithsonian. I'm excited to announce this morning that my office, under this initiative, 
will provide the financial support for the National Museum of Natural History to complete genome skim skimming for all U.S. fishes in the next two years. I firmly believe this will have significant positive impact for conservation industry and coastal communities. Unlocking knowledge that comes from collections will allow a new map of life, encourage participation, and create catalysts of change for a better, more sustainable world. I'd like to thank everyone at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratories and the Smithsonian for making the third national workshop on marine eDNA possible. This capstone event is a call to action. Simple, scalable, non-destructive, and non-invasive sampling of water linked with automated and community-based programs can scale to meet the pressing marine challenges we are seeing in our changing world. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Enrique Sala, leader of National Ge Geographic's Pristine Seas Program. Pristine Seas is employing eDNA sampling at its sites to set baselines and demonstrate what healthy ocean ecosystems should look like. Working with local stewards and communities, this program is inspirational and can pro provide an example of how we can engage both people and nature to deliver science-informed management solutions. Thank you. Henri? <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, a disclaimer. I don't know much about environmental DNA. Um, but I'm very lucky that in our team we have the great uh, Dr. Molly Timmers, who is our real expert. And thanks to her, we have been able to incorporate environmental DNA to our toolkit. Now, um, I am a recovering academic. Um, I used to be at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. But in 2008, I decided to quit my, my job there to dedicate my life to conservation full time. And because I had been, I had seen the impact of marine protected areas, especially no take areas. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I thought they had done something wrong. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when I quit uh, my professor's job at Scripps um, to work on ocean conservation full time, and at Pristine Seas, we work on, we help governments, we work with local communities to establish no take areas, highly or fully protected uh, marine areas, because they are the best mechanism, the most efficient mechanism to restore marine life. When we started, when I started and I came here with a, an idea, let's go to the wildest places in the ocean before it's too late and make sure that they are protected. Because today, you know, these places like this wonderful place with this uh, ag aggregation of bamb head parrot fish of a remote pristine atoll in New Caledonia, now, there were a few places that were still so remote, inhabited, that they were not fished. At, at least the reefs were not fished. But now there is really no spatial refuge in the ocean. Uh, industrial fishing fleets, as you know, can get everywhere. And we have seen the decline of reef species, like reef sharks, in places that were totally untouched just uh, two decades ago. So when we started, our goal was to save the last wild places in the ocean. Because these places not only were time machines, they were time capsules, as Ellen said before, they were the only way for us to understand the magnitude of our impacts. Only those true baselines allow us to understand how much we have lost or how much we have killed, how much we have destroyed. But also, these places give us a blueprint. They gave us, they give us still a baseline you know, to move towards to. If we protect an area and we restore marine life, we want that ecosystem to go to do, towards that baseline, right? And probably we will not get there. 
in most places because we have lost species ir irreversibly, like the Caribbean monk seal, for example. But in many cases, we can get as close to pristine as possible within a decade. So that, those baselines are absolutely essential. And the baselines before, the way we collected information about the entire ecosystem was getting a bunch of people in the water, <laughs> avid divers, marine biologists, and counting and collecting, right? But now, with environmental DNA, you know, we, are mo we have moved to another, another level. Right? We can really scale our work so fast. So knowing that um, I am not, after the two days you had, fantastic two days I heard, technical talks, discussions about strategy, and also congratulations to everybody involved in launching the three national strategies. This is so fantastic, so overdue. So now that everybody here is uh, you know, so excited about what happened, I want to offer a different perspective. As a conservationer, as a practitioner, how do we use environmental DNA? Right? And what are areas where improvement in environmental DNA techniques will be tremendously helpful for, for conservation. So I'm going to start by quoting this uh, wonderful piece where uh, my colleague Molly Timmers and many of you are, are authors about the recommendations for a national eDNA strategy. I assume that you already have the strategy all set. And as uh, Chris said, you are organized, are operational, and ready for investment, which is fantastic, right? Okay, so I'm going to provide the, the user perspective here. Right? So I'm going to start by quoting uh, the three main reasons for eDNA from that publication, from that opinion piece. Right? And you know all this, right? but I'm going to illustrate with three examples. The first one is we can use environmental DNA to detect species that are so rare that we will never see if we are diving. Right? We go to places, islands in the middle of the Pacific, inhabited islands, right? Maybe just a few hundred or a few thousand people, but that's enough to deplete completely the local shark population. We have been to places, I'm not going to name them, but in 100 hours of diving, we have seen one shark, right? We've been to other places where in one hour of diving, you see 100 sharks. The first place, the place where the sharks have been depleted, we could do all of our traditional diving surveys and not check that box of you know, great reef shark present here. But with environmental DNA, we have a great chance to detect those species there. Um, we are going to conduct our next expedition, pristine seas expedition to Papua New Guinea. And Molly is going is developing now the markers for detecting very rare species of sawfish, those beautiful uh, shark ray types with the long no nose with the with the teeth, and also the rhino rays. These are species that are critically endangered in most of the Pacific Ocean, but we hear that there are areas in Papua New Guinea that are still you know, harboring sustainable populations, self replenishing populations of these species. So. And Molly is going to uh, use eDNA to detect this. Another example I love is this one from the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean, there's this little uh, shark, the angel, the little escape, angel shark. It's critically endangered. It's gone from most of the Mediterranean. But a few fishermen in Corsica, in the island of Corsica, have been catching them over time. And, and they were puzzled. So why is this critically endangered? Why do I get fined if I kill the sharks? or I get admonished, because for us, you know, we don't think it's in danger, we, we see them all the time. So what, what do you mean all the time? A group of colleagues led by Laurent Ballesta and his group Andromeda Oceanology in southern France uh, went to Corsica to investigate. And they found out that there were a few places where the fishermen go and catch these, these sharks. They set their nets, about 100, 120 meters, between 80 and 120 meters for other species, but they incidentally catch the sharks. If you did an environmental DNA sampling survey around Corsica, you probably find environmental DNA signatures of the angel shark in these places where the fishermen catch them, right? Now, if we had just this, what, we would, what would we do? Right? It's critically endangered species. 
by European law, you know, you cannot catch these species. You have to protect these species. So what is the French government going to do? Close artisanal fishing in all of the eastern coast of Corsica, right? And this is where environmental DNA combined with natural history, and this is why it's so um, relevant that we are here today at the Museum of Natural History, which for me is, uh, you know, there is not just one Nash, um, Washington monument. For me, the 45 million specimens of marine, um, plus many others, I think there are over a billion uh, items in the Smithsonian collections. For me, this is another Washington monument. This is an absolutely extraordinary collection with incalculable, incalculable value. Combining natural history with environmental DNA allows us to be very specific in terms of uh, conservation management recommendations. So what the French colleagues did was, of course, get in the water. And, and they found the angel shark in these areas that had this peculiar uh, topography. These are nests of the pickerel. It's a small wrasse that lives in the Mediterranean. It goes up to 30, 20, 30 meters during the summer, but then at specific season, they create these nests. So they collect algae and they build these nests, and there are millions of these nests. They were able to detect these honeycomb patterns with a side scan sonar. And they found that um, in this place where you have billions and billions of, of eggs, this is a seasonal uh, spawning reproduction aggregation, but also it's a seasonal feeding aggregation. Not just for the angel sharks, but for many other species like this, this ray. So our colleagues collected environmental DNA along Corsica in places with the pickerel breeding aggregations and in places without. And guess what? They found um, correlation between the breeding sites and angel sharks. Places without breeding pickerel, they didn't, only one of them, they detected angel sharks. There was this clear correlation. But looking at the entire ecosystem, not just at the marker for the angel shark, they were able to see all these other species, some endangered, some vulnerable, that aggregate at these specific locations and times. Now, this combination of the natural history and environmental DNA now allows us to set recommendations. So now they can go to the French government and say, okay, to protect, to maximize the protection of this critically endangered species of sharks with a very specific and practical management action, right? these areas, the breeding aggregation of the pickerel, these should be closed areas to fishing. During that season, which lasts a month, there should be no fishing around these aggregations. Right? That would maximize that would reduce um, significantly the risk of catching the angel shark. Diving studies alone wouldn't have been uh, able to do this because this is between 80 and 120 meters depth. These guys are diving with deep rebreathers. Every dive means uh, you know, maybe one hour in the bottom means six or eight hours of decompression, even with the rebreathers. So this is very, very, um, consuming, time consuming, very resource intensive. But the combination of that natural history knowledge with the ability that the eDNA gives us to sample at a larger scale you know, provides these um, practical recommendations that before we wouldn't have been able to have. So this is one application. Um, and I'm from the Mediterranean, I particularly love this. The next one is the fact that with eDNA, of course, the species richness assessments are so much faster and cheaper and quicker, right? Um, this is, I love this photo. Um, I guess the curators are tired, everybody a photographer comes because they want all the drawers out. Um, but this is irreplaceable. I have heard so many people here in Washington saying, why are we spending so much money in keeping these collections, right? This is like stamp collecting. Um, who cares about this? How many researchers actually use the collections? Well, I think that's the wrong question, right? Because the things 
that we can learn from these collections is extraordinary. I remember with uh, Roger Sand uh, and Kirk Johnson was kind to take us to the facility on the other side of the river where the Smithsonian keeps the marine mammal uh, specimens. And when we asked to see the, the specimens, the pelts and bones of the Caribbean monk seal, it's a tropical seal species that was extinct. The last individual was seen in 1952, south of Jamaica. And seeing those pelts, wow, wouldn't it be cool to use eDNA, to use DNA, sorry, to use DNA from uh, those pelts and the bones and also from other museums? And look at the genetic variability. So we could estimate what was the size of the, of the population before it went extinct, right? How many monk seals could have uh, the Caribbean supported? Or shells, look, looking at the change in the thickness of, of the shells over time can tell us a lot about ocean acidification. Or marks on some of the shells in one period, but not afterwards, can tell us about the, dis the disappearance of the predators in, in some areas. So there are so many questions that we couldn't ask without these invaluable uh, time capsules. Uh, but now we can, it took over a century to collect all these millions of specimens, right? Today, with eDNA, with metagenomic sequencing, we can collect, uh, collect uh, similar or larger number of specimens in a matter of weeks, which is absolutely extraordinary. And I'd like to use the example of um, our last expedition in Palau. Palau has right now 80% of their waters protected. The government is doing a marine special plan to reevaluate which areas should be protected and which areas should be open to, to tuna fishing. And we were asked to go and fill gaps, research gaps, to inform that marine special plan. And most of the expedition happened on the Southwest Island. There are these five islands, four are inhabited by a small number of people. They are very, very remote. And Molly did the eDNA work there while Alan Friedlander and other colleagues did the visual surveys of fish and corals with uh, scuba diving. And I want to show you an example of these two islands, Sonsorol and, and Puloana. How many species of fish we found with visual counts, and Alan Friedlander is a reef fish computer. Th that guy can identify hundreds of species of fish you know, automatically and distinguish between males and females and juveniles with all these different colorations. So we have one of the top experts in the world identifying fish, yet Molly beat him with the eDNA, right? So looking at the fish counts, um, the eDNA detected more for both islands than um, Alan did with, uh, with visual, visual sensors. Of course, there are cryptic species that are underneath uh, corals or in crevices that you know, the diver cannot see, but there are also species that maybe were there half an hour earlier, right? So this is great that, uh, you know, pretty quickly we were able to find a larger species list for that, for that area. Now, knowing that Sonsorol has more species of fish than Puloana, which area do you think is in a better uh, ecological condition, in a healthier condition? How many people think that the place with more species of fish is in a better ecological condition? Some sort of, raise your hands. Okay, and how many th people think Puloana is, is in better? Okay, only Molly knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we cannot say, you know, species richness alone is not, is the simplest indicator of biodiversity, but it is not alone, it is not a good metric for the condition of a place. These two islands are in the same biogeographic region. They are next to each other. If one place had the same type of habitat, if one place had 10 species and the other one had 100 species, then we could say something. But when the difference is not so large, you know, then we need the natural history to complement the eDNA. And indeed, what Alan found counting the fish was that this is the biomass of fish, the grams of fish per square meter. Uh, Puloana, both 10 meters and 20 meters, has more biomass of fish, and look, it has red stuff, which is the sharks. That, there are no sharks, reef sharks at Sonsoro. So Puloana, even though it has less species, 
it has a better ecological condition. It's better preserved than the other one. There has been less uh, impact from, from fishing, right? So again, um, I also see people with the illusion of uh, the dream of having a boat, collecting a uh, sample automatically and drones, and replacing the museum collections, and replacing natural history work, right? It is complementary. What EDNA allows us to do is to do this at scale. Right? So I wanted to share this example because um, it, it, uh, it, it shows that we cannot rely on just one measure of biodiversity. Now, this relates to population size, right? So that's the third um, argument on, from that paper that you know, directed to um, policymakers who are not experts on why we need uh, eDNA. And eDNA indeed can be used as a useful index of uh, the size of a population. I know that we are not there yet for more species and there are lots of issues to solve, but this is one of the most important aspects to develop. And in the same way that we have these collections that are downstairs or in, in a facility in Virginia and Maryland that we can use any time it is so important to collect all of this, at least from a conservation perspective, it is so important to collect as many archival samples as possible. So we can store them. And we can use some of it to answer today's questions about conservation, like the angel shark. But we must collect as much as we can today and store so we'll have these samples available for when we have the right, the better techniques, the better technology to be able to get more of these samples. We are learning now from the lunar samples that were collected in the 70s by the Apollo crews. Using the technology we have today, much more precise, we have been able to do groundbreaking uh, findings that we wouldn't have been able to do in the 70s because the tools weren't there. So that duality of using eDNA very strategically to answer time-sensitive questions today, right, is as important as collecting this, building this archive, this collection, this physical collection to be used um, in the future as, as the baselines. Not just of those endangered species, but of entire communities. And this is what this example shows. This is one of our favorite places in the world, Millennium Atoll in the southern line islands in Kiribati. This is the first place we went to with pristine seas in 2009. We wanted to go to the most pristine coral reefs in the world. They belong to the Republic of Kiribati. They are between the equator and French Polynesia, five uninhabited islands, and one, four islands and one atoll. This atoll is crisscrossed by these reefs. And in these reefs, in 2009, the first time we went there and inhabited and fished, we found this extraordinary abundance of giant clams. We find some places up to 40 per square meter, four zero. It was a pavement. And in this lagoon, we, we had uh, the great uh, Forrest Roward, one of a great marine microbiologist from San Diego State University with us. So he measured the abundance of the numbers of bacteria in the water. And this lagoon had one of the lowest abundances of bacteria anywhere in the Pacific. But in 2016, the strongest El Nino year killed most of the giant clams. You know, this is a place where there is a film on National Geographic Channel and on Hulu, if you are subscribed to Disney or Hulu, it's called Super Reefs. There's also a 15 minute short on YouTube. Super Reefs, it tells the story of our going back to the Line Islands, to Millennium, and seeing this destruction, but then returning five years later and seeing the complete recovery of the reef. This extraordinary recovery because of the resilience that is provided by the fish, by the fact that that place is fully protected from fishing. However, the lagoon is so shallow it must have been so hot for much longer than the four reef, and most of the giant clams died. If we had done a DNA, eDNA survey before and after, we would have, of course, found the um, giant clam signal everywhere. 
if we had sampled the right areas, we could have found one or two clams that were still alive, right? And there was, there's a chance that sampling in the right place, we would have found also giant clams. But just having the signal saying the species is here in 2009, the species is here in 2021, doesn't tell us about the, alone doesn't tell us about what happened to this place. When we were there, we thought, well, the giant clams are probably the reason why this lagoon is so clean, because so many giant clams, they filter the water, they, they clean it from bacteria. And Forrest has this idea, let's do an experiment. Let's have some tanks with dead shells, some tanks with living shells, and some tanks with just water from the lagoon. And what we found uh, below, you can see on the left, is like a photo of the um, Hubble telescope. It's actually the fluorescence microscope of the, of the water in the aquarium without shells and with dead shells. And there are so many bacteria. There are million bacteria per milliliter. On the right, they are almost not detectable, right? 10,000, we're talking about two orders of magnitude lower. Then we had a culture with Vibrio, the genus of bacteria that uh, produces cholera. And dead shells, all these yellow are Vibrio, thriving Vibrio. On the living clam water, almost none. So this is why when compa comparing, having the eDNA doing the metagenomic sequencing of the entire water, then we can uh, find that when we go to a pristine site, the number of bacteria in the water is very low and most of the uh, microbes are very, very small photosynthetic bacteria, like Prochlorococcus. When we go to a place with people, boom, the photosynthetic bacteria basically disappeared, and we have a lot of pathogens, like Aeromonas and um, Vibrio, human pathogens, right? So if we had, the, when we collect that water sample, if we look for the giant clams plus the microbial ecosystem, then we can tell the entire picture then we can show that, ah, yes, there, are, there is a signature of giant clam in 2021, but the microbial ecosystem is completely different, right? And that allows us to say something about the size of the population of giant clams. Right? It's not just the amount of giant clam DNA that is in, in that part of water, but it's the accompanying ecosystem. So if we know about the natural history, if we know about the, the role of this species in the ecosystem, then we can use this DNA to um, recreate the full picture. And this is why I love so much now um, that, um, we're so lucky to have uh, Molly with us on, on our team that combining our visual surveys, our natural history studies with, in some cases, museum collections and everything that eDNA uh, give us, now we can recreate these ecological baselines for many more places at a scale, much faster. We can also um, help identify areas to protect, like, in, in the case of Corsica and the angel shark, it was just fi uh, seasonal fish enclosures, but maybe there is this hotspot for soft fish that uh, Molly will find in Papua New Guinea. That will be an um, uh, ideal place for a, for a nautic area, but also for, for smarter management, including fisheries management, as the example of the angel shark show. So um, this is how we use eDNA for our work. This is why we are so excited about all the developments. I'm, Personally, so excited about the, the launch yesterday of the new national strategies and blue economy, biodiversity, and aquatic eDNA. It's all, it's all linked together because um, in genetic research is not just about bioprospecting, right? It's about understanding the ecosystem. It's about us managing better our activities. So we are on the, at an inflection point, and I please ask you to um, develop uh, these uh, tech tools faster, please. Um, <laughs> um, US government, Smithsonian, provide more funding for this uh, work and because we need it for achieving our goal of 30 by 30, uh, having 30%, at least 30% of the ocean protected by 2030, because that's the only way that we are going to prevent the collapse of our life support system. So thank you so much for the great work you do, and I can no way to to hear the, the final uh, proceedings of um, all your discussions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Enrique. I think we have a moment for a few questions, if anybody has some questions for Enrique.
I'm, I'm going to ask a bit of a loaded question here. <laughs> you mentioned in the beginning the value of these collections, and I think you probably know that some, something on the order of 5 to 10 percent of our collections are actually digitized. And so the ability to apply AI models to ask the kind of questions you brought up. So I'd, I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on, on the use of AI, but how we need, we need basic data then to apply those models to. You know, absolutely. The example of Corsica would be a great one, where we can, knowing that there are, we know from all our natural history knowledge in the Mediterranean for so long, that there are species that aggregate to reproduce at specific locations and times. Groupers and snappers do the same thing in the Caribbean, right? And we know that there are species that also travel to these places for feeding. So knowing that there are these associations, if we had this number of samples from all over the Caribbean or from all over the Mediterranean, now with machine learning, we can help identify some of these places that maybe it's 20 meters deeper than what the divers, um, you know, where the divers have been collecting the water. They have never seen these aggregations, but they exist there. If we had this uh, grid at depth also, then we'd be able to use AI now to identify all, the, all these areas, and then we can ground truth them, right? But this, um, it would, it, this is where AI comes in, I think. Um, and this is just one very particular example. But the ability of AI to be combined with, uh, with this um, basic uh, collecting to get the, that baseline, the possibilities are, are huge. And I think we're going to make many discoveries that we cannot, we, are, we cannot think about the questions yet. But identifying patterns and identifying places is go are going to open up uh, new lines of research for sure. Any questions for Molly? <laughs> That's great. You are doing a fantastic uh, job here. Um, my question is that you are, I don't know the size of the protected area you are uh, trying to, uh, to protect. And uh, whatever the size, uh, how do you uh, manage protection uh, in the context of uh, climate change? Because the environment around will change. Even if you protect an area, if you have a temperature shift, a temperature rise, or Yes, how do we protect against climate change? A, a marine protected area can abate some threats, right? The direct threats, fishing, habitat destruction, uh, direct uh, pollution, mining, drilling. It cannot make the water cooler. But the protected areas, especially the no-take areas, gi uh, give us two things. One is the resilience, right? We have seen in the Mediterranean, for example, because of warming, we've been able to do an analysis on our data from uh, 30 years al along the Mediterranean from Spain all the way to Israel. And there is this gradient of temperature. The Eastern Mediterranean have become much warmer. And we have seen a decline in the biomass of fish that is independent from fishing pressure, right? This is due, the analysis show it's due by warming. The no-take areas have not shown that decline, right? So that's one example of how it helps uh, provide that resilience. Another example is the Southern Line Islands, where the abundance of fish, especially the fish that eat algae, the parrot fish that are huge parrot fish, schools of hundreds of surgeon fishes. When the corals die in the Caribbean because of bleaching, the seaweed immediately overgrow the corals, and that's it. Once the, the algae take over, there is no chance for the corals to come back. In this place, there is not a single alga that is bigger than this, right? Because you have this continuous pressure. So the, the fish keep the reef clean and allow for coral recovery. And that resilience can only be afforded by a no-take area where the fish can, uh, can achieve abundances that you cannot achieve anywhere else. If there is fishing, you will never get to these sizes of fishes. You will get, never get to those abundances. So that's one aspect uh, of the resilience where the no-take areas help. Also, we did an analysis of um, 2021. We published a study uh, in the journal Nature looking at protecting the global ocean for biodiversity, food, and climate. And we did an analysis of what would be the, what are the priorities to achieve greater conservation, the greatest conservation gains today and in 2050, look, um, using the most extreme climate change, a global warming scenario. And we found that 
of the top priorities, the top 10% of areas that need to be protected now, 90% of these areas are still top priorities in 2050. Right? Because even though warming can uh, kill the corals in one area and can make some species of fish or crabs or lobster move to, like the lobsters are doing, uh, going from Maine to Canada, uh, moving to higher latitudes, but still that place will still have an ecosystem. People will still depend on that local place and that place will have a greater abundance of marine life and will be able to produce local benefits. So what these fully protected areas give us is they buy us time while we really um, do what we need to do absolutely of reducing emissions, face off fossil fuel emissions and, uh, and, and slow down the warming. When you're talking about the creation of these no-take areas, um, how have you been able to get like the local fishing communities to get on board with that? Like obviously, like the benefits are huge, yeah. Um, but yeah, has that been a challenge? Actually, the challenge is not the coastal artisanal fishermen; it's the industrial fishing lobby. You know, there is this ideological opposition that anything that is not the status quo. But actually, fishing communities, indigenous groups, come to us, come to Britain Seas, and hey, help us, help us get industrial salmon farms from our pristine fjords where, do, where do we do our traditional fishing. Help us get rid of the big trawlers that decimate the sea mounds, which are the breeding grounds for the species that we catch on our islands. No, and the Cahuescar and Llegan indigenous peoples in, uh, in Chile. Juan Fernandez local community in the Pacific coast in Chile too. Pacific Islanders, Inuit and First Nations in Canada. You know, we, have, we are invited to go and help them I um, improved the fishing. The latest example was at our oceans conference in Athens uh, a month ago. The fishermen from the island of Amorgos in the Cyclades, they went, one of the, the president of the fishing cooperative went to Turkey where a, a community has created five no take areas and they're catching so much more fish than before, right? The endangered monk seal, Mediterranean monk seal goes into the reserve to eat. They have sharks in the Mediterranean. This reserve is crazy. So the, fish, the, the president of the fishing cop went to Turkey, saw that and said, came back and said, guys, we need to do this too. So they asked, they know that they have nothing left and they know that it is their fault. They cannot blame the Chinese. They cannot blame global warming. It's overfishing. The worst enemy of fishermen is not protected areas, it's overfishing. So these fishermen asked the, Mex uh, the Greek government to create three no-take areas in the best places where they catch fish because they know they have seen it in other places. So, um, so more and more we see these examples where the local overfishing has been so rampant that the local fishing community say that, well, we do need these areas to help replenish the rest so we can still have a living here. It's really positive. Thank you. Thank you. How fantastic was that? That was great. Um, you know, I just take two, two takes off of that. I mean, I think you really incredibly highlighted the importance of these baselines. I mean, I think as we move to this born digital pro entire profile of ecosystems using eDNA, we're gonna need these training systems so we know what's good and what's bad. What do we wanna see in our information? So having sites where we can use comparative even maybe taxonomically agnostic profiles while we build the libraries are gonna be absolutely important. So it's important for us to be out there sampling now, having these gradients and being able to compare because as you talked, Ellen, about the AI, it's the collections, these are collections, these will be collections and we're gonna to need to have these time series so we can go back and unlock and look at those patterns and use machine learning towards that. Um, the connections, the, the other aspect of all the connections, the, the giant clam story and seeing what we heard yesterday with the pace, uh, it reminded me, would we see a signal in the remote sensing from the, from the blooms potentially of the, the color change that might key the, the indication that something's going on in the water there, we might wanna get our heads in there and look. So again, that tie and that complexity and the interchange of these data streams and being able to interrogate the earth with these many, many patterns 
of, of uh, both life and the context of it are going to be really, really important moving forward. And it's a very exciting time. Um, and I think we can say, you know, as, as Dr. Luchenko said yesterday, you know, this is no longer an experimental tool. It's ready for prime time and it scales, which is the key. The scalability of this, as you mentioned, is absolutely critical. And we are on the precipice of great things. We're already doing it. You guys are all doing great things. And it's really fantastic to see it come together. We're pivoting from having to do these pilot studies. It doesn't work compared to this. It's like, it works. Let's just start doing it. We still have to do the other stuff as complementary, different kind of nets, different kind of censusing. But we can do the censusing rapidly at scale, and we get these ecosystem impacts. And it allows us to find durable solutions. I think that was an important message we heard throughout the message, uh, messages over the last two days. And as I mentioned, that information and what you can unpack from a sample, again, you can, just, you can do the fish, you can do the algae, you can do stuff we don't even know we should have looked at. It's this kind of Swiss Army knife unpacking that uh, lends itself to a diversity of users. It kind of is, it's kind of like a, a hedge, a portfolio hedge in case science shifts. Well, you can use it for this, you can use it for that. And for that reason, um, we've invited eight uh, thought leaders to come up here, and you guys all have incredible portfolios uh, of opportunities, I would say. And we're really anxious to hear your thoughts on all, all the potentials in this. We heard about possibilities, uh, and I think that's a really great word, and let's put that into action. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite, uh, we'll start, we've got an eight-person panel. We've invited them to come up and give a little uh, summary of the impacts that they see that environmental DNA will bring to their programs and actions. And we're gonna run that through and then at the end we'll have a, um, pull out some tables and have a, a Q&A session with the panel in a moment. So, Anne, can I invite you to come up first? Uh, Anne Kissinger, Kissinger from uh, US Geological Survey, please. Hi, thank you everybody. I'm Ann Kinsinger. I'm the Associate Director for the Ecosystem Missionary of the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so grateful to be invited. Um, really looking forward to the panel and to hearing the outcome of the workshop. It sounds like you've had a fantastic past couple days at Johns Hopkins and listening to Dr. Lubchenko and... Um, Really, this morning when I joined you for breakfast, just felt so much passion and energy from the crowd, particularly after learning that you got up at 6.30 to catch the bus. I thought that was pretty darn impressive. <laughs> so as you may know, the U.S. Geological Survey is a part of the Department of Interior. Um, we work to provide science to help achieve sustainable management of con and conservation of the nation's natural resources, particularly fish, wildlife, and the habitats upon which they depend. And we think of ourselves as a science arm of the Department of Interior in the sense that we are a non-regulatory, non-management policy neutral organization that really focuses on providing that critical information to managers at the time and scale and format that they can use to make their tough decisions. Most of our work, I would say virtually all of our work, is in partnership with folks like you out here, um, other federal agencies, state agencies, tribal entities, territories, uh, you name it, and uh, I think we've got a partnership there. And uh, that's really key to, uh, to our work because we really want our results to be delivered on the ground uh, for folks who are trying to protect fish, wildlife, and their habitats. So um, we have programs within the ecosystem mission area in species management, in land management, in bio threats, invasive species, environmental health, climate, a wide range of, of uh, ecology-based programs that um, we, we like to think help our partners make the best decisions possible. And throughout all of these programs, we have been using eDNA. Uh, probably for the past at least 10 years, um, we've been very heavily into this realm and, and uh, trying to provide information for our partners. And it's a very high priority for us. With over 100 publications that we've, uh, we've done in the past 10 years on developing, improving, and using eDNA, we've really tried to work with all of you to improve the power and precision of eDNA. And as we move into implementation, I thought it might be useful to talk about what we're hearing from these partners I just mentioned 
about what they want from our eDNA efforts. And it's a long and daunting list. <laughs> they want to detect species earlier when the opportunities to take these management actions and develop policies would be more effective. They're asking for increased precision, additional functionality, and they want to use eDNA to provide inferences that are more biologically meaningful than simple presence and absence. They want eDNA for more sophisticated purposes, such as detecting targets in different media. And they're always looking to detect new taxa. And I didn't mention AI uh, in my notes, but certainly that is a, a really fertile field for future investigation, and I know uh, we, I actually sit on an AI task force within USGS to look at how we can, within the bounds of, of safety and reliability, how we can really advance uh, that technology with eDNA and many other things uh, to do better at what we do. Our partners are definitely use, uh, interested in using eDNA to site and monitor offshore energy developments. My colleague Rodney Clark, Clark is here to, to uh, talk about that a little bit more. And they wanted to use it for biodiversity monitor, for monitoring, for assistance in study design and advice on using these eDNA results in decision making. And they want all that more quickly and less expensively. <laughs> so we've got a big challenge ahead of us, but it'll be easy, right? So uh, not a major focus of our work since, um, since, 19, since 2022, I'm dating myself, uh, has been in the Bureau, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Ecosystem Restoration, Early Detection Rapid Response Framework that we've been working on with our DOI uh, partners and sister bureaus. So this is an interagency effort uh, that emphasizes the use of eDNA for early species, invasive species detection, and to expand our capacity to make eDNA surveillance operational in locally led partnerships, in connecting what's now kind of siloed information, and creating processes and tools to improve detection. So some of our noteworthy advancements associated with this EDRR framework include developing community consensus standards for integration of, of eDNA and metabarcoding data for public display in our non-indigenous invasive species, aqua, excuse me, aquatic species database. Uh, we've uh, worked with others to develop networked autonomous eDNA sampling technology with our rapid eDNA assessment and deployment initiative and network, fortunately has a shorter acronym, ReadyNet. Um, and we've done that with the Monterey, Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Research Institutes and dozens of other, uh, other partners. And then this year we've begun to pi a pilot project uh, with several states in the southeastern U.S to operationalize the EDR, EDRR framework and develop tools to conduct surveillance for several priority invasive species there. So uh, we're ready for the implementation, as, as we've said, and uh, moving forward on it. Uh, in addition to the framework, across the country, our USGS scientists are working with our partners to use these eDNA methods to inform our understanding of ecosystems, and in particularly, to inform managers and decision makers. Examples of this work include helping to develop and provide science for the long-term and large-scale U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service-led uh, invasive carp monitoring program, identifying specific research needed to realize the potential of eDNA as a biodiversity monitoring tool, and we've already had some discussion of that. Um, and some uh, purposes beyond invasive species, the use of eDNA to detect threatened and endangered species and species of management concern to states and tribes, to detect culturally important species, and pollinators as well is a big effort for us. And in the marine environment, our USGS scientists are using eDNA to monitor marine communities in areas affected by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and assess com uh, coral community restoration. So a broad suite of tools that we're trying to develop in concert with our partners. We're really glad that the eDNA strategic plan signals this widespread support. Just looking out over the audience, it's very clear that there's a lot of energy and excitement around this, and we certainly share that, um, particularly for the use of molecular-based detection technologies as trustworthy techniques for answering specific management questions 
and that the plan emphasizes standardizing protocols, investing in centralized tools, and providing guidance that explicitly empowers authorities to use eDNA results in decision making. The USGS plans to continue its investment in eDNA technologies and tool development and to work with everyone to help build consensus for its use as a reliable, actionable part of biosurveillance. So my hope is that this plan will codify the use of eDNA in natural resource management, highlight its use for rapid, cost-effective, and streamlined biodiversity conservation, and we're just an enthusiastic supporter for the strategy. And uh, several of our scientists are here in the audience and they've contributed to the writing and development of the strategy as well as worked with many of you out there on specific projects. So we applaud this work, uh, we value the work, we're excited by the work, and I really uh, look forward to working with you in the future. I'm very excited to hear my fellow panelists' points of view on this. So thank you very much. Thanks, Anne, and now we'll uh, invite Ellen back up to the stage. Yeah. As we all know, marine biodiversity is central to life on this planet, and it's in dire trouble. We need new tools, new strategies, bigger and broader partnerships to address this. eDNA is an exciting new tool in our toolkit. But we also need to remember that we need to work better with local communities and listen better to native voices. The Smithsonian is proud to have co-chaired the newly developed National Aquatic eDNA Strategy and the Na National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy. And we are committed to being part of the implementation plan to achieve these goals. As leaders in ocean biodiversity, stewards of the largest marine collection, and an institution dedicated to disseminating knowledge to our millions of ocean visitors. Don't forget to run up to the Sant Ocean Hall while you're here. We are committed, committing resources towards three main goals to meet this moment. All fall under our, our newly launched Ocean DNA program, which is a key initiative in Natural History's Ocean Science Center. First, as I mentioned in my introduction, we are committed to generating a nationally trusted voucher-based reference library for most biomolecules likely to be used to monitor communities. We will start with US fishes, but expand quickly to corals, commercially important species, and protected and invasive taxa. We will democratize our collections and work with other museums to source missing species and coordinate these activities through partner workshops. Second, we're expanding our curation to cover environmental samples, as I mentioned. It's urgent that we archive these time capsules of ecosystems, and we look to our scientists, their collaborators, and our interagency partners to help us enhance our existing biorepository assets with this new extension of the national collection. Finally, we will set up demonstration sites around the country to employ these new sequencing approaches in concert with ongoing long-term monitoring efforts. This will demonstrate the power and effectiveness of eDNA to sample whole ecosystems in our changing world. Importantly, we will work with local and national decision makers to develop digestible and meaningful and timely met metrics to track change measure return on investment, and put nature on the balance sheet. We are working across the Smithsonian, here at Natural History, at the Tropical Research Institute, at the Environmental Research Center and through Marine Geo, and at the National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute to use eDNA and all the tools in our toolkit to develop standard usable measures to reliably and transparently assess the health of critical ocean ecosystems. We will continue to work with our interagency partners to improve our knowledge of life in the ocean. These efforts demonstrate that we can work together to produce evidence-based science for nature-based solutions. We now need to move from talk to action. We are excited to leverage our expertise, collections, global capacity exchanges, and public reach 
to help lead this national eDNA enterprise. Thank you. Thanks. I'll, uh, now I'll invite uh, Sarah Kavnick from NOAA to come to the stage. Sarah, please take it away. Um, so I just want to say Ellen ditto to everything you said first. <laughs> um, so we, we are all here because we, we care about biodiversity. Sustaining living nature is a central challenge of our time, one of tremendous importance and scale because biodiversity connects everything important to people. In the US, it also, um, coming from Department of Commerce, I must also say that the ocean and its connection also is really important for our economy. It relates to over 400 billion in our economy and it's growing at a faster rate than other parts of the economy. And this doesn't even include all of the ecosystem services that we see coming out of the ocean that we expect to be quantified as we move forward on nature capital accounting that will provide more of that information of what biodiversity and ecosystems provide. So it's a really big deal. This session today highlights progress in biodiversity science and applications that are unfolding in real time. At NOAA, we have seen unprecedented changes in some of our fisheries. eDNA will be really important as another tool in our toolkit to be able to understand what is happening before change happens, be able to predict and project it as it is un unfolding, and know how to manage it and deal with it. Um, in short, I call this fish forensics. We need eDNA as one of those critical new tools to be able to put into that toolkit. It's a really exciting time right now for us because we have multi these powerful new tools for documenting and understanding biodiversity and how species are declining or shifting with climate. On the positive note, I also want to say I'm really excited about the potential for eDNA for us on fisheries management. There's a seminal paper that came out in 2022 showing that on the West Coast, eDNA sampling was able to replicate our traditional fishery survey practices to be able to understand how many hake were in the water for management. This is a key step towards showing the eDNA can give us the information we need, similar to our traditional surveys, which puts us on a path for being able to use this technology as it scales, as it becomes cheaper, and as our standards and understanding of how we use it expand beyond hake um, to other fisheries. eDNA is also important as a scalable approach. It is one in a broad suite of tools that we include right now in our R&D and are looking to, to be able to provide us with the broad information we need on biodiversity for remote sensing, imagery and acoustics in our fishery survey. Right now I see this as a quilt of information that we need to understand fisheries and ocean health and understand where it is headed. Solving the challenges of biodiversity requires all hands on deck. I'm so excited about the broadness of the panel that we have and all of the members here that we have today. Um, with this, we need new ideas, new technologies that knits all these ideas together, and we need to move towards a global, real-time observation and information sharing system with all this information. And we need the leadership in this room in capacity development and exchange and in developing new partnerships to advance shared biodiversity objectives. I want to thank Smithsonian and Johns Hopkins for hosting and for all the partners today in this work. Most of all, we need leadership, as Ellen also stated, to move from talking to action. We need to develop trusted evidence-based biodiversity standards for monitoring, reporting, and verification that are essential to real nature positive actions. We need scaling of technology and standards across groups, regions, and sectors, and we need the spreading of these rigorous practices for management and information. For my former work in financial sector, and also as my role in NOAA under the Department of Commerce, I also see incredible opportunity here for this work to scale to new industries, but also to unlock capital for conservation and restoration. The information that eDNA provides could allow us to create that information that is transparent, that allows for new funding to go into these efforts. This is also fundamental for us, for NOAA, for measuring and monitoring the ocean and the development of the potential of new sectors um, that we will see emerging from this emerging technology. We also need to remember to engage with diverse communities to understand their needs and how to mobilize the right biodiversity information to, need, to meet them. 
We need the trust of our communities as we're doing this type of work, and we need to make sure that we also remember to work together with them for engagement and trust in this new technology and its applications. I really welcome the engagement from this room and outside as the summaries of this meeting and all of the learning and the pathways forward, um, and I'm really grateful for all the conversations I've had today. I also just wanna end on a really positive note. eDNA, it is such a cool technology. Um, when I try and summarize it to people as I'm talking about what eDNA is and the potential, I'm like you take a little bit of seawater and you know what's in it, and then you know what was in that ocean in that region. It's something if you told me that as a kid, I would think it was science fiction. But we are here at this point where we can scale it, we can build it out. Um, I welcome everyone to read the strategies that have come out in eDNA, but also the strategies that we have at NOAA about where we see the potential. It is across all of our lines where we're seeing applications in use, and I'm just really excited to get us all going. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, we'll invite uh, Woody Turner to come up to the stage. He's the program scientist for the biological division uh, at NASA, so uh, take it away, Woody. Space. Space. <laughs> um, first, just thanks for, uh, to the Johns Hopkins APL and Smithsonian for this uh, really important, great meeting, but really important and timely meeting. Uh, so yeah, I work for a space agency, and particularly in the science division of that agency, we spend a lot of time looking back to the aerosol space, trying to address existential challenges like climate and, of course, biodiversity loss. And in doing the latter in my program, we're greatly challenged by a lack of in situ data in time series. You can't do biodiversity in space, obviously, without that in situ data. Uh, now, we've got an expansion of, of these, these tools, but I gotta say, when I started my job, I, you know, just trying to build a biodiversity program there, I thought, okay, the satellites have been around for maybe 10, 20, we've got actually 50 years Landsat, the grand old man, but you know, a couple of decades, not that long, and surely people have been collecting biological data for hundreds of years, and there'd be this amazing record of, of what was where, when, sort of biogeographical history of our planet going back for a couple hundred years, probably most of it collected by, you know, British vicars and folks like that in the age of Darwin. And as I, as I got into the, the work, I realized that, frankly, um, there's very little of that time series data. And in, in fact, the satellite data is incredibly robust in comparison, which is sort of crazy given the, the short length of time we've had these satellites up there. So anything that can bring data, two key things you need to know for, for ecology generally, place and number. Where is it and how many of them are there? And eDNA does, certainly does, you know, distribution does place, but increasingly they're getting at abundance. You know, how many of them are there? That's, that's gold. So that's, this is an incredibly powerful tool that as people have been saying here, scales. And so it will amplify the, the value of places like this museum, the holdings in this museum, which are also gold, they're precious. It's the history of life. Museums like this contain the history of life on our planet. What could be more important to us as living organisms, as a species, than the history of life of which we are a part and which sustains us? So this museum, incredibly important, but eDNA will complement this historical data. And it's not alone. There are other in situ techniques that are coming on, acoustics, camera traps, telemetry. We're getting down to tags for organisms that are less than a gram in size, putting them on, not only on songbirds, but on insects and stuff like that, tracking them around for movement. This is all critical. Um, and so we've got this, as I think uh, Kevin Yamahara said yesterday, this instrument revolution going on in in situ systems, both the technologies, the models to use them, the understanding of, of the production of the DNA and its degradation. But at the same time, we have a coincident revolution in instruments on orbit. Uh, that's really allowing us to, to sort of get the top-down view and bring the bottom-up view from ED and other tools together. Thinking about things like imaging spectroscopy, hyperspectral imaging, which gives you the full spectrum from the UV out through the thermal. This is an amazing new technology that gives us so much more information than pre previous multi-band sensors have done for the last generation or two. Um, 
LIDARs, think giant laser pointers in space, giving us the structure of the vegetation, even getting down into you know, 30 meters depth, in some cases in optically clear waters, radars that penetrate clouds, give us 24-7 you know, access to what's going on on the ground. It's an amazing time. So we've got these complementary revolutions going on in observations just in time as we need it to, to, to save life on this Earth. The, I want to shout out the two strategies that have been announced, the Aquatic National EDNA Strategy as well as the Ocean Biodiversity Strategy. These are the context in which we can start bringing these, these communities together, coordinating these data sets for the understanding and the prediction we need to manage well going into the 21st century. Um, it's, an, it's a great time to be doing this. We also, have, I'll, I'll call it the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, which a number of the institutions taking part in this, in this um, workshop are part of, again, gives a framework in which these observations can be housed. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic going forward. Thank you for this great, great meeting, the chance to talk to y'all. It's fantastic. Love this legendary Baird Auditorium. It's just really cool to be here. Thank you all. Thanks, Woody. Hey, space uh, is the earth the next frontier. That's good. I like it. All right, uh, it's my pleasure to bring uh, Mike, Mike Weiss up to the stage. I, I had the uh, pleasure to work with him over the last two years as co-chair of the strategy. Uh, he's in charge of the Marine Mammal Program at Office of Naval Research, so uh, take it away, Mike. Thank you. I thought he was gonna say whales, but uh, hopefully more than that, from space to whales. Um, thanks, everybody. It's so good to see everybody and, and uh, be up here to, to get a chance to talk to you. Um, you know, as I'm sitting listening to the other speakers, you know, one of the couple of the messages that stand out to me are just the, the time is now, and as Sarah said, for all hands on deck, um, the time is now, the technology is there, the demand for biodiversity data is there outlined in the, in the biodiversity strategy. So there's a clear signal, a clear need, and eDNA really is an exciting tool that can deliver um, on, on a lot of those needs. Um, so why is the Navy involved? Why is ONR involved? So just, just very briefly, I uh, put my ONR hat on versus my, my uh, co-chair hat. Um, so uh, the Navy, uh, uh, it, I'm with ONR, so that's the S&T branch of Navy, um, developing capability, developing technology. Um, and the Navy's out doing testing and training all the time. They're required to have permits. Um, so there are two primary activities that are required under NEPA, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, right? And that is to uh, assess for your potential um, effects of your activities prior uh, to your activities. And so that's uh, the big environmental impact statements and, and Navy's got those for uh, entire Eastern, so there's a US EEZ, so Eastern US, Western, the Pacific, and out in Hawaii as well. So huge areas of the ocean. So we have to assess for our potential activities. Um, and, and then secondly, once we start an activity, that we're then legally mandated under those permits to monitor for the potential effects of those activities, the testing and training, right? So on the pre side, um, in developing those EISs, we need to understand how many animals are out there. And of course, with marine mammals, uh, uh, they're, they're protected under the environmental, um, uh, well, I'm sorry, the MMPA, uh, as well as the ESA. Uh, most of the large whale species are endangered, all the large whales and many of the others as well. Um, so in those pre-activities, we need to understand uh, where animals are, presence or absence. We need to understand abundance and density. So if we're gonna estimate the number of takes under Marine Mammal Protection Act, how many animals are exposed, we have to know how many are there. We're also required to understand how we might be affecting them, right? So there's a lot of effort going into understanding behavioral, physiological response, and population level responses. So we're doing a lot of work trying to thread that needle from early exposures, how that might affect an individual, how that might affect an individual's health, their fitness and ability to reproduce all the way up to the re, uh, their, their population level. 
So that's on the pre side, and then also on the, uh, on the monitoring side. So once we have our letters of authorization to go out for testing and training, we have to monitor. Um, and that's a long-term endeavor uh, to monitor for not only the numbers of animals, presence, absence numbers, but health of those populations, demographic structure of those populations. So those are all difficult and challenging things to do uh, in the open ocean. Um, so uh, a lot of the traditional means in which we do that, we got about 25% oh, of my portfolio is kind of developing those technologies, things then that transition to other programs within Navy um, to be implemented in an, a more operational capacity. Things like passive acoustic monitoring, visual observations, IR, we're developing things like whales from space. Um, and so eDNA fits very, very well into that as an exciting new technology uh, that is here now for certain applications, but also from the ONR, again, basic research perspective, we're looking forward of what it could do. So I think one of the analogies, for me at least, is, is passive acoustic monitoring, so putting hydrophones in the water, listening for animals. Um, when you're looking for animals, there's a lot of animals that you miss. So when you stick a hydrophone in the water, you can hear so much more. Um, so 10 plus years ago, um, 12, 15 years ago, right, there was, people were putting hydrophones in the water, um, and we were understanding that there were animals there, but there weren't, there wasn't a lot of availability, right, of that technology. It, you couldn't go out and buy a recorder that would record, certainly couldn't buy something easily that could detect and classify and potentially report data. So after years of investment now, um, we've got uh, technology that's commercially available. You can go out on a buoy, you can put it on a profiler, there's um, um, uh, gliders out there applying the world's ocean that that are collecting that data. Um, so again, the, the technology was developed. Um, you're out there, uh, commercialized it, getting it out, using it operationally within the community. Another aspect of it is, is really um, understanding and being able to interpret that data. Um, so for acoustics, it was really understanding how can we use that, those detections to develop understandings of abundance and density. And so to me, I think there's a lot of parallels with eDNA. eDNA is such an exciting field because it's moving so quickly um, and much faster than, than passive acoustics. We, we've seen in the last, well, in the workshop in October and, and Kevin presented um, uh, on Tuesday, I think it was, uh, all the exciting sample technologies that, that's out there. It's already becoming available here and now. Um, so it's pushing forward. Um, so I think for, for us, for the Navy, um, there are things that we can certainly use um, here and now. Uh, I think there's also in the future some of the things that are exciting uh, for us to think about. Uh, there was a talk, um, Megan Parsley's talk, um, I believe on Tuesday as well, about eRNA. What are the other things that we can learn about populations? And as I mentioned earlier, we want to understand not only the numbers of animals, so abundance is absolutely critical, and that's cutting edge. We need to figure that out for these rare targets as well as fish and other species. Um, but also getting to the point of understanding, can we ID age classes, population structure? Can we understand health status of those animals? Um, and that brings into the, the question, the autonomy. How can we do this and scale and do that in large scale out in the ocean? So that's, that's some of the things that I think are very exciting on the R&D side. And that, I think that's a role the federal government can play in pushing that cutting edge um, for uh, eDNA technology. Um, so I, I think as we move toward implementation, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, obviously, I've, I've, as we got the strategy, we have to take, our, take a moment and celebrate. Um, that's uh, certainly a milestone. And then as we've done in the last couple of days, turning our sights toward implementation and really, um, as we've heard from, from others, it's gonna be key to have those partnerships as we move forward um, within government. We've absolutely got a partner um, with industry, with academia, um, um, states, regional, uh, um, region 
entities, uh, tribal communities, tribal nations. Um, and that's uh, not only in the coordination and uh, coordination bodies, we've got to figure out how to do that um, on a regular and continuing basis, not just as we develop implementation, we're done. This is going to be an ongoing process. Um, and with this exciting technology, things are moving so quickly. New technologies are coming on all the time. Our ability to develop um, best practices and standards are going to be evolving. So that's going to be a, a need to be a process, not an endpoint, that implementation. So we're going to have to set up kind of that structure for that um, as we move forward. Um, and I think uh, I think that we'll talk more in the in the session here, but I think there's some exciting uh, possibilities um, of, of uh, working together um, across all these communities um, as we move toward implementation uh, for the years to come. So with that, thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to get uh, Rodney Cluck, who's the uh, chief of the Division of Environmental Sciences at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We're going to have a little, little theme here for the next session. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, thanks everybody, for, for having me. Um, yeah, it really is a pleasure to be here. And, you know, the Bureau of Ocean Ener Energy Management is very, very interested in uh, eDNA. I am the chief of the Division of Environmental Sciences, but that oversees our environmental studies program. Uh, our environmental studies program turned 50 years old this last year, so we've been doing science in the ocean for quite some time. The, the program conducts science to inform decisions on the activities that we oversee in the, in the ocean, and in, in, in particular in the outer continental shelf. But since the Inflation Reduction Act passed, um, that area that we have is up to 3.2 billion acres. Um, it was about 2.3, now it's 3.2, so adding about a billion acres to that. Um, and we need to do the oceanography, biological, physical, chemical, but also um, <clears throat> the social science, cultural work um, to oversee the, these activities. These activities, like I mentioned, are, uh, uh, we have oil and gas, we have marine minerals, we have carbon sequestration. We now have critical minerals, green hydrogen, and then of course the real big one is offshore wind. So a massive area <clears throat> and a massive amount of activities occurring in those areas. So the important thing is to work smart. Um, to me that means using the best technology suited for the job. Um, and that is one big part of that is eDNA. But again, we can't really, we can't do this alone. Um, I mentioned our 3.2 billion acres. My science budget is around 30 million a year. Uh, that's about a tenth of a cent per acre. Uh, so it's very important to partner with other feds, uh, academics, private sector, uh, NGOs, tribes, everyone. We want to work together to make sure this happens. Um, it's been mentioned before, all hands on deck. I think now really is, is the time. Um, but really what I'm excited about in particular with eDNA if you just take some of these activities we oversee, like offshore wind, um, I mean, we need to, and we must, uh, understand the, the pre and post construction effects and the biodiversity around, the, around these wind areas. Uh, and what are the potential impacts to marine life? Again, eDNA can be a part of that. Um, you know, we still have, like, as I mentioned, authority for offshore oil and gas. There's still a lot of activity going on in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. Uh, in the event, God forbid, of another oil spill uh, would, would allow us to track biodiversity uh, if, if this happens in, uh, hopefully, guide remediation efforts. Um, we have sand and gravel and went through marine minerals. Um, mainly that's for beach renourishment, renourishment and barrier island. Uh, renourishment, but eDNA could allow us to see if sea turtles are in the area so we could stop operations. Critical mineral mining, these deep sea nodules that have existed there for you know millions of years. Um, again, um, have authority for that. So understanding the deep sea benthic ecology to understand biodiversity of the area and, and potential effects of, of mining, this could also be useful. Carbon sequestration. Um, one effect of carbon, carbon sequestration um, could be uh, heating of water, which could impact fish and fisheries. 
So again, eDNA could be very important for that. Um, so it's advantageous in many ways, uh, non-invasive monitoring, enhanced detection, improving ecosystem understanding, could be this broad scale that I was talking about with this mass ge massive geographic area. And one of the most important things, I think, is just monitoring change over time. Um, now, what we'd really like to see, or what I would really like to see, is real-time eDNA. I uh, mentioned this before. Uh, even if not instantaneous, I think real, uh, near real-time processing could be really, really valuable. Um, again, it, it could allow for a rapid response uh, if there are invasive species outbreaks or contamination events. Um, there could be adaptive sampling as well if you could do it in near real time. Uh, and, and you could target certain species, for example, with offshore wind, if you could uh, understand that there's a North Atlantic right well in the area. Uh, you know, while constructing an offshore wind facility, you could, you, you could stop construction at that moment and, and wait. Uh, exploratory surveys, uh, near time, a real uh, eDNA could provide kind of quick biodiversity snapshot. Uh, to inform uh, in-depth studies in the area, which could be useful in uh, various geographic areas. Um, as, as I mentioned, we have the, the U.S. territories now, so there's a, a vast amount of uh, science that needs to be taking place uh, off these areas. While there's some going on, there's already interest in areas like Puerto Rico for offshore wind, uh, Guam. Uh, already, already has interest as well, so that's going to need. Uh, so there's a big need for, for baseline science to inform those decisions and in, in, in those activities. Um, uh, Bohm hopes to be doing some some work in those areas relatively soon, and hopefully we'll make an announcement on that before long. Um, while I really am a big fan of if eDNA, I think it is really most powerful when combined with other techniques. I think uh, kind of what Mike was mentioning as well. Uh, eDNA along with passive acoustic monitoring, along with uh, animal telemetry, um, along with li LIDAR, radar, this combination of techniques is really where the rigor happens. Um, because you e have the eDNA to provide this powerful tool for detecting species, presence and absence, passive acoustic monitoring can, con can occur continuously over time, and, and monitoring uh, allows re researchers to identify species through vocalizations, uh, Observations through telemetry, whether that's satellites or, or human observations, enable direct observation of species and their behavior. And then, of course, you could have radar, which is very important for offshore wind, uh, for, for birds, understanding that as well. And that's, let's not forget that uh, eDNA could also be useful for, for, for birds, detecting in, in areas where, where wind farms are. And all this data, all this information, which is just a flood of data, analyze it all through AI, right? Uh, so that would be ideal moving forward, uh, understanding all these things and uh, being able to really have a, a clear management picture of what's going on. Um, so I think this synergistic approach, this combined effort uh, could have improved detection confidence, classification refinement, and really a more complete picture of what's going on and enhance monitoring strategies. But I think, you know, moving forward, what's really important, too, is to think about uh, eDNA use for environmental compliance. Are developers out in the ocean in compliance? Is the federal government doing what it's supposed to do with regard to compliance? So moving towards an eDNA usage that's compliant with law. I think we can move, move in that direction as well. Um, so I think this combined effort provides us more robust uh, picture of potential impacts and activities and really does also, I think, allow for more informed mitigation, which is that's what it's all about, science to leading to mitigation and uh, siting these facilities. Where uh, sh should we site them and where not? It's probably the more important question. So it's the job of the Environmental Studies Program to ensure that proper information is collected uh, so that we can protect the environment. But again, our job is to also benefit society and provide energy. Uh, so eDNA is a much, much needed part of that equation as far as I'm concerned. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Rodney. Now, uh, 
we'll, we'll welcome Ruth Perry up to the stage. I'm really anxious to hear what you have to say. <laughs> she, you're head of regulatory affairs for the Offshore Powers America and also Shell's officer for the Wind Portfolio of Americas, right? Very good. There you go. Thank you, everybody. It's such an honor to be here in the Hall of Greats and not just the people in this room, but the history, the species, all of the good remarks that were made before me. And it's, it's an honor to come up and represent the industry sector and more broadly um, talk about what are the opportunities with industry. And I just want to thank Ellen, the team at the Smithsonian, John Hopkins for, for allowing um, an energy scientist to come up here. Um, this place holds such a special meaning to me, not just being an oceanographer, but it's actually the place my son took his first real steps, not like the toddler stumble, but as soon as we walked in to the dino hall, he wanted to be put down and just walked straight to one of the skeletons. Now, me being the oceanographer, tried to get him to walk to Ocean Hall, but it took a while to get out of the dinosaur hall, but it'll always hold a special meaning to me because it's that enthusiasm of bringing people together um, and the awe of the work that we do in terms of how can we scale things like eDNA to really understand what's in the areas of the oceans that we can't see. Um, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. From the energy perspective, uh, like my colleague Michael talked about from ONR, we're also a permitted entity. Um, Rodney spoke a bit about that in terms of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management responsibility to do energy planning, to be informed by the best available science. On our side, we want to ensure the way that we provide energy, um, whether it be oil and gas or offshore wind, is done in the safest and most responsible way. And part of that is understanding, respecting, and mitigating impacts to biodiversity in the global areas that we operate, from uh, the coastlines to 3,000 meters plus. Impact assessments are such a critical ability to do that, and I think everybody knows who's been out to sea, it can be very difficult to sample at the scales you need. Um, Henrik talked about it today in terms of divers' capabilities, there's vessel capabilities. eDNA offers the opportunity to really sample at scale and to understand the things that we can see and that we cannot see. Um, particularly in the world that I work in, just like Michael, marine mammals. Um, being a regulated entity, we're often having to defend, well, what are you going to do if you can't see the animals, you can't hear the animals? eDNA can offer an ability to fill a gap. The effects and variability of a system, whether it's natural from the impacts of climate change to the introduction of offshore wind, which some can argue in this room there's impacts and trade-offs with conventional and renewable energy. While oil and gas in deep waters is very limited facilities, offshore wind and the switch to renewable is 80 to 100 machines that we're putting in areas of the ocean that don't have infrastructure. So how is that system gonna evolve with the presence of infrastructure? We've learned over the decades and the BOEM Environmental Studies Program in the Gulf of Mexico in an area that didn't have hard structure, the benefits to fisheries and others that can develop over time um, and the migratory pathways that can evolve. One of the studies I had the pleasure of working with when I first started at Shell was the Nature Conservancy and mapping the migratory blue ways that were happening between Shell's offshore structures in the Gulf of Mexico and starting to see the emergence of great white sharks down to vampire squid to the invasion of lionfish just based on trying to assemble data. But if we had eDNA, we would have been able to do that study in a fourth of the time because we would have been able to take the samples from the surface of our platforms down to 3,000 meters across the entire Gulf of Mexico and just think about the availability of data versus an ROV operator calling me because they've seen something they've never seen and do we need to report it to the regulators? Um, so it gets us into extracting amount of information and utilizing platforms of opportunity, which is really what I want to emphasize today is while many of the public or the private sector is working, whether it's fishing, 
or energy. They want to be, we want to be part of these public-private partnerships to contribute what we can contribute to understanding the biodiversity of the areas that we operate. Because in turn, that allows us to mitigate appropriately. It allows us to understand where we should or we should not go. And it also allows us to track the change over the many decades. If you think about offshore wind, we're in a unique position um, where I've often heard if we only started this in oil and gas, we would know so much more about areas like the Gulf of Mexico or California. Offshore wind, we have that opportunity. We're working with regional science entities like the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance that was started between the commercial fishing and the offshore wind developers to the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, which partners industry, NGOs, the fishing industry and government agencies to really fill in this environmental spectrum of where we're working. eDNA gives that characterization. Like I said, it's the blueprint of what we can see and what we cannot see. And being a scientist, but also having to get permits and explain you know, what's happening in the systems where we're building offshore wind, eDNA really offers an unprecedented ability uh, to do those impact assessments, to do the effects studies, and to really see how the systems change over time with the presence of something like renewable energy, which in itself is an industrialization in areas that haven't had structures. Now we can use a tool like DNA, eDNA, excuse me, to see how the ecosystem is responding to that and what's changing in that system. I remember in the Gulf of Mexico, my uh, third week at Shell, I got a call from uh, an operator at our Stones facility and he, he was hearing some odd noises. We have to listen to a lot of the equipment that's working very deeply, and he was hearing these clicks over and over and over. And they had been trying to figure out if it was related to one of the, the subsea drilling systems, or our Stones facility, it's unique in the sense that it can lower the risers, the drill risers, um, lower them in the water, and then move the vessel out in the event of a hurricane because there's 200 people working on this vessel, right? And so they thought it was something associated with the system, right? They said, well, someone said to call you. You're a biologist, you're an oceanographer. Sitting there going, well, this sounds like an engineering thing, but I'll try. It turned out it was sperm whale clicks, and they were hearing them constantly. So we worked with um, the National Academy of Sciences, with FUGRO, um, University of Southern Mississippi and Texas A&M, and we did in JASCO Applied Sciences, and we took a year of, of data um, at 3,000 meters almost to the EEZ, central Gulf of Mexico. And we heard sperm whales every day, all the time. But no one could correlate the amount of acoustic activity we were hearing with stock assessment surveys, because stock assessment surveys can't get out that often. It's very expensive to go that far out. It's very expensive to do real-time observations at 3,000 meters. eDNA offers an affordable way where we can collect that information and we can pair it, like it was said by my fellow panelist, with other techniques like acoustics, field-based surveys, um, and really understand the amount of biodiversity and the temporal and spatial scales that it exists in areas where it's really difficult for scientists to get out. And that's what we like to try to do in our ocean partnerships is figure out how we can offer our infrastructure, our platforms, and the data that we're collecting, such as the ROV footage that's going up and down the ocean every two hours all day long, to offer that kind of information out there. Because we can start to see, first of all, the foundation of the ecosystem, and then how that's changing over time. What I'm really excited about also using autonomous systems is the ability to get eDNA on those systems. One of the unique things I'm working with offshore wind with it being renewable energy is how can we use autonomous systems that are powered by renewable energy and not have to rely on batteries or conventional energy. The ability to put eDNA on gliders, surface gliders, profilers, and collect that information, even put them on the turbines themselves and send it back in near real time, is tremendous when you're looking at things from critically endangered species like uh, the North Atlantic right whale to species that don't come in very often. Because believe it or not, every about seven years to the dot, 
we have killer whales coming in the Gulf of Mexico. We don't know where they've come from, why they're coming, or how long they're staying, but eDNA offers more of that fingerprint of information that we can then understand how species are acting in those environments and what their population health is and when we can expect them so that we can better cater our mitigation work, we can better cater uh, the technology that we're using to be able to understand, detect, observe, and mitigate any of those potential impacts. So I just wanna leave you today that I think the, the past two days of work and having these national strategies really opens up the opportunity to scale public-private partnerships in a way that we can reinvent how we're looking at biodiversity, that we can really evolve from things like the census of marine life to technology applications where now we can characterize the full US EEZ from mapping to biodiversity. So thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the panel. Okay, and finally, I uh, welcome Danny Ferrelli from uh, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy from the Office of the President. Danny. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good almost afternoon. Um, it's quite a pleasure to round out this very esteemed panel um, as we start to wrap up what has been a very successful and productive eDNA workshop. So thank you again to all the organizers and the meeting hosts for everything you did in bringing us together. Um, in my role as at OSTP, I serve as the co-chair to the National Science and Technology Council Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology. Um, that is the formal mechanism in which agencies and the agencies represented here work together to us. Um, to tackle problems and topics that can't be solved by a single agency alone. Um, I also, on a personal note, wanted to add, prior to policy, I worked in molecular ecology research, so this has been a particularly exciting effort um, to work with the eDNA task team and strategy leads to develop, um, and I've really enjoyed trying to advocate for that and elevate it within our office, resulting in the release this week. Um, so we all know this has been a very long-awaited effort, and the enthusiasm and momentum towards implementation has been very exciting to see. It's been clearly articulated uh, throughout today and earlier this week how the diversity of life underpins health, opportunities, culture, recreation, um, and economic well-being of coastal communities, but all communities across the U.S. and globally. We've seen the many examples reiterated today through our keynote and our panelists um, to restore ecosystems, to site and develop offshore energy, to address climate change and the climate crisis, and to explore the possibility of nature-based solutions among, among so many others. This week, it's been mentioned the three complementary strategies released um, and elevated at the White House re um, revolving around national aquatic eDNA, ocean biodiversity, and foundational to all of this, how we work together to build a sustainable ocean economy. All of these are needed to help drive forward all of these efforts, as well as recognize them at a national scale and show to our international partners as well how the U.S. is leading and advancing in this space. All of these strategies and the important work here today address a clear need to advance the ability to track the status and trends in living nature and how to forecast that into the future to enable policy management and decision-making processes. And all of this is very central to achieving a sustainable ocean economy in which effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity can go hand in hand. Timely information is also needed to support identification of a management of growing marine protected areas for biodiversity protection and as key tools towards implementing our global and national 30 by 30 goals that we heard about earlier today. So all of these complementary initiatives really chart the course to how we can achieve a more robust system for sustainably conserving 
and protecting this wide variety of aquatic life and advance the biodiversity, biosecurity, and conservation goals that we're all here jointly working towards. As a critical tool to each of these, eDNA monitoring and the novel work being completed can really help assess the effectiveness of these types of nature-based solutions, monitor the changes in species, and forecast these changes um, to really inform our federal decision-making at the highest level of government possible. And so acknowledging these many benefits and the connections and everything you've been here discussing, it's even more critical that we jump into action, we leverage this excitement and this attention that's being shed on this topic this week and throughout um, the entire month, um, and work into implementing the National Aquatic eDNA Strategy. All of this will be very crucial towards achieving the key outlines that are outlined, um, that are woven throughout, and ultimately the successful implementation will enable us to deliver on our ocean climate, sustainable ocean economy, ocean justice goals, as well as a range of complementary existing federal mandates. And we need to keep the end users in mind, as we heard, the conservation uses in mind that we heard. How are we translating all of this information? How are we using this to, to tell compelling stories, um, to tell the compelling nature of why we need to be making these national level decisions, why we need to be preser um, preserving and protecting marine resources um, and these critical habitats. We need to keep that in mind as we move forward and we've heard so clearly articulated today those prime use case and examples of this being done. And so think about that as we start to move into implementation. You know, what story would you like to tell with this work and how can that be compelling um, to those throughout government and throughout our private sector partners. So meeting all of these many challenges, it's going to require a coordinated, um, collaborative effort across all sectors, not just the federal representatives uh, welcomed here, but our, you know, we only had one industry partner on this panel. We need to expand that. We need to have all sectors and all um, parts of the community involved in implementing this so that we can seed success um, across and seed implementation across these many sectors um, and work together. So it's going to take everyone on this panel, everyone in this room, and many of the other partners not here that were involved uh, to move this effort forward and call the implementation successful. So I look forward to helping achieve that success moving forward. And I just want to reiterate that you now have recognition from the highest level of government uh, with the seal of the president on this strategy document to move forward. So leverage that as you want to move forward. Um, and also thank you to everyone, federal and non-federal, who contributed to drafting of the strategy. Um, it's been so well received and we're really excited to see all the outcomes to come. So thank you. Thanks, Danny. Okay, uh, if everyone wants to stand up for just a quick sec, take a little moment break while we're gonna reformulate the stage here. We're gonna bring out a table and invite uh, the eight panel participants to come up. Um, I just, you know, while, while we're doing this, uh, it's pretty clear some common themes came out there. The, the face of biomonitoring is changing. So uh, it's a pretty exciting time. Okay, uh, please take your seats and let's get some questions going to the, to the panelists. Um, I'd like to take a, take a moment and, and give everybody a round of applause for tremendous presentations. I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to see all the threads coming together and all the opportunities. So without further ado, who's got some questions? There's got to be some out there. Anybody? Wow. Come, come on up to the mic, actually, if you can. It's, or do we take all the mics away? I just want to hear Chris. Oh, no, we've got, oh, sorry. Yeah, Jesse, right here. Oh. And Nina you know, will be there in a minute. Yeah. Go ahead. Right, right there. Question for Noah. 
In 2024, will the National Marine Fisheries Service make a commitment that uh, every white boat that goes out uh, on a fishery survey will also collect water for eDNA? We are moving towards that as much as we can, budget allowing. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I was only able to hear the last set of talks, but anyone who's able to answer this, I'd appreciate it. Um, lots of eDNA right now is annotated through transitive annotation, as in it's, um, uh, we are assign, uh, assigning identity to it based on things that have already been assigned identity, but it's a line of telephone, right? Um, and especially in the age of AI and machine learning, when we have these kinds of data sets that are public and might have data that have been misannotated either benignly or um, antagonistically, um, is there any kind of plan uh, or uh, uh, approach that you all know of that we are uh, working towards to make sure that our public databases are robust against um, uh, misannotation or um, even possibly like harmful to our uh, biosecurity types of annotation. Thank you. I, I am definitely not an uh, expert on this, but that's why I think it's so critical that we find um, common, transparent, open platforms. For example, GBIF uh, is our primary partner at the National Museum of Natural History. And I think having a platform that is trusted is really critical and open and transparent is really critical for this because once you lose that openness, transparency, and trustworthiness, every nature-based solution you try to build off that is not going to be reliable. We see this in the carbon markets, right? There's a lot of distrust. And so we have to make marine biodiversity um, have that trustworthiness. I'll just say I mentioned it briefly, but I think it's really critical for the community to come together around standardization and protocols and, and particularly quality assurance methodologies that we can that we can all agree to and, and uh, use uh, from this point forward. And beyond that with the community, we need to make sure that we have the education system so people are aware of this and understand and have trust in the technology. It can't just be the super technical scientists that have trust in the standards. It needs to also have the community engagement, particularly in the places where we're trying to deploy this and do the science now um, so they learn and understand what we're doing. This is really rewarding. Uh, when we finished the second national workshop, we felt really good that the practitioners had come together with a unified voice that this is ready to go. Uh, we had the academic practitioners, we had lower level people within your organizations, all in unified agreement that this was ready to go. Now seeing this higher level agreement is really gratifying. But there are at least two audiences that I'm concerned maybe aren't as tied in and I'm curious to know whether you agree that they're not tied in and what we're going to do about it. The first is Congress. Um, we've done congressional briefings, but I don't see a lot of people from congressional staff here. Um, I don't see anybody at the congressional level who's essentially owning this. Uh, the second is the general public. Um, Sarah, you said it perfectly. This is so cool at parties to talk about the stuff we do. But one of the things that I did um, yesterday after the successful meeting is I Googled eDNA to see if anybody at the newspaper level had picked it up. And I had to get through 100 Ednas who had died in the last few weeks before I could find anything on what we do. So how do you think we're going to evolve to get these next two audiences into the discussion? Guys, as it was pointed out earlier, Steve, Capitol Ocean Week is this week. I mean, you guys should all be leaving here and going straight up to Capitol Hill Telling this is a chance to actually talk to members and staffs that, and, that you rarely get. So this is a key week. Where it's not accidental, I don't think, that this happened uh, uh, the same week as Capital Ocean Week. Agree, there needs to be more awareness up there. But it's such a compelling story, as you said. Uh, but it just needs to be communicated. So please, head on up to the Hill and take advantage of Chow ASAP. 
And just to, to follow on to that, so um, we have uh, the co-chairs in the committee, we were invited to engage with uh, the National Marine uh, Sanctuary Foundation um, in regard to Chow, and there's a panel discussion tomorrow morning specifically, uh, living laboratories and eDNA and biodiversity are part of that. So I think that's our, our inroads in engaging with that community and starting dialogue. So I hope, again, that, that that's definitely one, you know, one thing on the calendar for tomorrow morning at Living Laboratories, and again, hopefully a start to, to further engagement in, uh, in that community. Yeah, and I'll, t I'll take on the public as a, as, a, as a challenge for the Smithsonian that we really need to step up to. You know, we, we are constantly um, looking at the San Ocean Hall and revising it. We are looking at how we transmit information to the public. And I think you go much far outside of this room and no one has heard of eDNA. And that's, that's on all of us, but it's certainly on an organization like the Smithsonian where we get millions of visitors coming through this museum every year. Let's start really educating them on some of these exciting tools that we have. Although I will say, for the people that sniff out opportunity and new technologies and when our market is forming, we're starting to get inquiries from venture capital in a way that we haven't and are following the work that we're doing on eDNA. And I'm going up tomorrow to New York for a series of events and I'll be at investor events. And I asked, what are some of the topics that I should be ready to be prepared for and talk about with NOAA's positions and sciences? And one of them was eDNA and the future of eDNA. So the word is getting out, and we need to make sure that we do these types of education so it's not just the scientists, it's not just the early stage venture capitalists, but we have the broad community engagement, particularly if there's a potential to use it for fisheries management. We need people to agree that they believe in the science and understand what the standards of the science are and to have the trust that they have in all of you. In this room on science needs to extend beyond the public. Yeah, I'll just add one of the things um, building up the science and the education, the partnerships are probably the most effective advocacy tool as well. And we've had the most success, I think, as a consortium of ocean community around these topics, particularly on the Hill going together, right? Because if you take the partisanship out of it by, sh uh, by who shows up together, it's a very powerful message when you have the federal agencies, both regulatory and science, alongside private industry and the military, and you're going up to the Hill and says, saying together, this matters to us, and here's how we kind of all benefit, and that you have to fund this. And you know, for instance, the private sector who has more flexibility in the way that we fund, or data management, or in-kind contribution through platforms of opportunity, that can go tremendously against NOAA, who's, you know, or BOEM, who's working on annual budget cycles and all of the complicating factors to say, we brought the smart people in the room to figure that out. We just need you to support it. And it benefits all of us, right? And it does better based on whether you're focused on conservation, resource management, or what other bipartisan pieces. The fact that it's a nonpartisan group that's going up together, um, we have found it's been really effective, um, at least for the Hill piece, and then complement that against the work that the Smithsonian can do, that the work that others at this table can do with their respective audiences, and we kind of tell that storytelling together can be tremendously powerful. And if I could add one thing, one group that I think is missing as well, and speaking of storytelling, it's engagement with tribal communities and tribal entities are so important. I'd mentioned during my remarks um, the, the territories, uh, you know, working in uh, Guam, Northern Mariana, Puerto Rico, um, American Samoa, it's so important to, to engage these, these local entities and understand, you know, culturally their significance and ties. Uh, ties to the ocean. The last thing you'd want to do is develop wind facilities off Guam and then negatively affect, you know, the subsistence fishing or, or just cultural ties to that and cultural heritage. So that, th th those groups, I think, can really inform us and have that broader historical kind of paleocultural story to tell. Yeah, I'd certainly agree with you there, Rodney. I think it's really important to uh, also learn to weave together indigenous knowledge with our, what we people call Western science, and um, we can bring new knowledge to the table that really we have no other way of getting that sometimes goes back 10,000 years. Uh, but I was just gonna do a call out to the scientists out there 
about becoming storytellers. Uh, many of you, and I know many of you already are fantastic at this, but it's so important and it often goes against our training to really learn to, um, to connect with the whys, to connect with who you're talking to and, and your audience and build that trust with them um, and then to convey the stories of why the science will make a difference to their everyday lives. So I would really, there's lots of trainings out there. We just offered one in the ecosystem mission area that was really wonderful um, about that connection with your audience. And really, instead of saying, here's what I want the audience to know, to sort of switch that around and say, here's what I want the audience to be able to leave with, um, and not and and sort of make that a two-way street. Um, but anyway, for you know those of you who haven't done it, getting um, science storytelling communications training and just be out there on the landscapes uh, telling our stories would be really helpful. Hi, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Nicole Miller with the NOAA Omics Program. Um, a really common theme among each of your talks today was scale. Um, we are moving from uh, molecular scale to entire ecosystem assessments. Um, that's a long range. If we go, are there any recommendations that the panel has for where we can look at technologies that have accomplished this type of scale before in this challenge, um, and where, where what technologies can we look to for lessons learned and for guidance or is this really something that hasn't been done before? Yeah, so looking at the planet as a whole, we think a lot about scale. Uh, it's by far our biggest challenge. Uh, we have a call actually right now out on scale if you want to you know, look at proposing to NASA, it's there. But I, I would say that um, scale challenges both from a theoretical perspective and understanding how life scales, but also from a practical perspective which is really relevant here in terms of how you integrate data from platforms operating at different scales. We still don't do that well. It's really challenging. Uh, models are a, one way to do that. Putting things on a common grid are one way to do that. Um, the climatologists have shown us some uh, techniques there, but we still, in terms of living things that move around uh, and that have their own, they're not just physically driven, they are affected by physics and, and chemistry, but also they have their own internal dynamism, it's challenging. And, and the best we can do now is put trackers on them, understand their movements in relationship to what's happening with the environment scale, which is why our whole, our whole deal is about trying to get things to scale from these ecosystem level down to the, as you said, the molecular level. But uh, it's, it's cutting edge research still. Rather, rather than an example, I'll give maybe a key aspect of implementation towards the scalability, and that's partnerships. To broaden the scope of partners to maybe non-traditional partners or those you haven't thought of to enable scaling is going to be very important, not only from a technology development point of view, um, but an investment point of view, but also just geographic distribution. Are there, is there a different sector? Are there citizen scientists in that space? Are there local communities? How can you engage folks who are in different um, geographic areas you're interested in and bring them into your decision or your um, scientific assessment and into your process and kind of maximize that value? So think critically about those partnerships, how to do it and how to really expand to non-traditional um, partners that you haven't used before. Um, when I also think about this, I think about the, all the observations that we have on temperature and salinity and growing more in BGC um, using Argo and how we have the map of the global ocean. And you have that as a full map of the ocean, but then you also have everything that's happening in the coastal zones and like much higher mesh that is occurring over coral reefs and other places. So we understand what, what the conditions are horizontally and then vertically in the ocean. I think there's a lot to learn from the setup and that's really been in the last 20 years that we've set up Argo and scaled Argo. And there's a lot of lessons also of if you start building this for research and then you start needing to do for operations, what are those points? How do we make sure that we sustain these things and how do we also have the science evolve and the observation systems evolve as we learn so much as this technically is rapidly evolved, technology is rapidly evolving at the same time that we're creating all that learning. I think I mentioned in my talk the importance of our partners and 
uh, at least within the Department of Interior, those partners are managers and decision makers. And, and so I just wanted to point out that to me, the most important, there is no one scale that is most important. The most important scale is the scale at which the decisions are being made. And that can be global, it can be national, or it can be regional. But um, that's why it's so important to find out what these folks need and what their workflows are before we commence some of this foundational research so that when we ultimately develop our uh, uh, tools uh, to help them answer those questions that we're doing it at the appropriate scale. I think with scale, we often, or too often, get caught in the constraints of the individual components of the system. So if you're an academic institution, you have your motivation and drivers. If you're an early R&D, entrepreneurial technology, you have different drivers. But what we don't, and, and if you're government, you have, you know, federal cycle funding drivers, you don't get the investments for the data. Jesse and I have been on opposite sides of, you know, trying to figure out, okay, you're going to get all this data, where's it going to go? The IUS program has been pivotal, pivotal in figuring out how to do some of that and tackling some of those challenges. But it, it almost requires you to step away from the constraints and say, what are you bringing to the table? And then do essentially a systems mapping across the partnerships to say, you know, for industry, right, we, we're bringing platforms with offshore wind that are going to be out there for 30 years and require, through a regulatory process, levels of monitoring, right? Okay, so instead of putting ourselves in an overly precautionary, we're monitoring because we think something bad's happening, we should be saying now we have platforms that are going to be out there for 30 years that are going to be serviced and going to have data returns. And maybe industry can contribute that for some value. And it can contribute some dollar contributions to the data management. And then someone else can bring the sensors to the table, right? And we're not paying for the sensors, but we're offering the platform. We don't do enough, I think, of putting the constraints aside and instead mapping out what benefits all of the different partners can bring, and then figuring out how to map that construct, right? So then everybody has a role that's unique and specific to their ownership of the entity that's at the table, but then you're not expecting, you know, someone like Noah or Bohm who has to, who has to make decisions to carry the burden of the entire process, right? I think if we can reframe the way we think about partnerships and how we construct those partnerships and, and maybe put aside some of those, those traditional barriers that seem to stop us, that's really how we're gonna achieve the scale. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with that as well. I think uh, we really have an opportunity now um, you know, now there's a handful of wind turbines out on the, on the ocean, right, in the United States, but in 10 years, there's going to be thousands. Each one of these could be a laboratory for learning through partnerships with developers, uh, the government, academics, to where we use each of these arrays, these um, uh, turbines again, to collect uh, eDNA, to understand uh, more about uh, you know, just changing ecosystems, changing climate. So I think right now really offers a you know, huge opportunity to think differently about things, think differently about partnerships, and think about you know, what kind of science do we need for the next five decades. Great. Great. I guess if I could make one more point, Rodney, no, you gonna, always. Gonna, you got, you got, I know. It's great. Yeah. We're going to have two, two more questions. Okay. I see two more out there. And then, you know, I've got. Jesse. Yeah, some of us have been some of us have been suggesting we need uh, one or more national test sites uh, to speed technology development, to help with technology comparisons, to move toward the real time sorts of things that uh, Rodney was speaking about. I was going to ask Ellen if uh, Smithsonian would be willing to host the first national test site for eDNA. She just said yes. <laughs> Maybe some of the rest of you would like to comment on that. I'll comment in, in um, thinking about implementation, um, one of the ideas that, that um, uh, actually Jane uh, talked about with us on Monday was when we're thinking about implementation, thinking about demonstration projects. So demonstration sites for different technology and different applications you know, across the board in, in various agency and, and community needs. So I think that's a critical aspect. Wind you know, is, is a great example of one that cuts across 
um, you know, um, several agencies and a, a good example of a, a NEPA application deals with endangered species, listed species, things like that. So I think identifying those use cases where we can really demonstrate a, a given technology, we can an application, um, I think that's going to be critical to, to pick those several use cases that we can really highlight how well this can work in these certain circumstances. So. Yeah, and don't be afraid to actually try. I think we get so in the minds that it has to be a perfect example versus these types of things just inherently have adaptability. So as long as we're making irreversible decisions, if we pick a test site and, and it doesn't work, we can move the test site, right? That doesn't result in a failed experiment. So I think also is we have to consider there's an adaptability as we try these things. If we don't get the partnerships right the first time, we can adapt those. We're not making irreversible decisions when we're trying to figure out how to scale these things. It's not perfect. Um, it never is perfect, right? So, you know, enemy of good type analogy here. So I think if we can respect that there's adaptability, we can try some things, see how they work, learn from those, whether it's in decision making or regulated entities or scaling the technology. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't make sense to put it on offshore wind turbines. We don't know until we try, right? Okay, one more question, then we're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah, following up on Steve's uh, uh, question, uh, I think eventually the to have this uh, eDNA observatory for the U.S., it will require something like a sat uh, the cost of a satellite, which uh, Woody Turner reminded me was nine a billion dollars or something like that. How do how do the agencies uh, come together? Who who would step up to lead something like that, or how how do you get that done? <laughs> Partnerships. <laughs> And a lot of education outside these halls down on Capitol Hill. And so um, please, all of you, engage and educate on the thinking of this, and we will be pushing it. And we have our, we have our national strategy. We have our own agency strategy. I think other agencies have been pulling together their, their works as well. Um, so we're all putting together what the pieces of this look like, and it will require a push on cohesive strategy and the funding to be able to do so. And not not only on the investment side, which is a very clear need, um, but you know, all agencies and entities would need to identify that as a priority. So it needs to be a common thread across agencies and also one that we can see with our external non-federal partners to really gain that momentum within the federal government and then have that um, complementary initiative on the non-federal side as as well that ever everyone else is alluding to for investment. As a quick addition too, there are a lot of synergies to be had across what we need to be observing in the ocean. And I also encourage people to be thinking about what those synergies look like as we create these platforms. Thanks. I think there's a lot of synergies that are already in existence that we can absolutely leverage. I think we're past halfway in many, many instances. So let's give the panel a, a round of applause. Um, you guys stay for a second. So uh, we're going to wrap up really quickly, Peter and I. I just want to say thank you to everybody again for um, uh, coming down and being part of this. It's been a tremendous learning experience for me. I hope it's been for you. We're making incredible progress. If we know anything, this technology is rapid, it's rapidly advancing, but we've got to start implementing it. So really exciting for the next time. Uh, the challenge to us, too, is we're a visual species. You know, humans, we, we like to see things, like you mentioned, we don't Catch, we, it's our challenge to make that invisible evidence based on biomolecules more visible. I encourage you to go out and see the visual objects that we've got in the museum. That's why we have the objects. And then tell the stories that tie these threads together and make the narratives important for place. It's really, really important. Place is what people resonate with. So uh, again, a big thanks to everybody who's put this together. A special shout out to Neve here, who's helped so much for uh, organizing everything. I'd like to say thanks. <laughs> And, and everybody, and the whole staff, we had a whole fleet of people out there meeting and greeting. Um, for those of you who left your luggage, you can leave it till 4 p.m. And uh, please do go explore the museum. It's fantastic. It's an incredible resource. And uh, thank you all so much for, for being part of this. And I'll turn it over to Peter. Yep. Chris, um, 
I also want to say thank you. Um, on behalf of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, what a pleasure to be able to co-host a meeting like this with all of these really important things going on in the uh, coming uh, out of White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's been amazing to see the collaboration between academia, government, industry, all of the different things that are happening in this room. And I, I just have to give a shout out for the origin of our organization as the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory set up to be the outreach to the government and the government facing entity of academia in that case. Um, being able to serve in this position and uh, have this back and forth and really uh, kind of sharpen each other through this process has been amazing. And I get the great pleasure to stand up here at this point and offer uh, something that, that we say at the end of uh, a number of meetings um, that we have at the Applied Physics Lab as we close things. Just um, one thing, I am feeling right now that this does not feel like the end at all of this meeting that we're having by any means and any stretch of the imagination. And we have a lot of work to do. And it's been an amazing honor to um, have all of you here as, uh, as we come up with all of these new implementation um, strategies and all of the other things that need to happen in the future. So with that, there's a lot of work to do. We're not done by any means. And I would offer, um, in closing, um, the, the statement that we often use uh, going out of uh, events like this at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Be bold, do good work, and make the world a better place. Thank you, everyone. And with this, we will close the workshop. Thanks, everybody.